Timers are one of the most important features in modern microcontrollers. They allow us to count clock pulses and have a variety of uses from creating delays, generating periodic interrupts, measuring time between events, and setting up pulse width modulation signals. In this episode, I'm going to show you how to use a basic timer with STM32. Timers start with your main CPU clock, which you'll see referred to as H clock in the datasheet. This signal is connected to one or more prescalers, which simply act to divide the clock. We'll assume one prescaler for our simple example here. Let's say we run our Nucleo board with a main clock speed of 80 MHz. If we set the prescaler to divide this clock by 80, then we get a 1 MHz clock signal coming out of the prescaler. This then feeds into our timer. Our timer is simply a running counter that counts from 0 to some maximum value that we set. Thanks to the prescaler, this timer increments once every microsecond, which is equivalent to 1 MHz. Most STM32 microcontrollers have several timers available for you to use. We'll work with one that has a 16-bit counter, which means that the most it can count to is 65,535. For this demo, I'll be using a Nucleo L476RG. We won't need any additional hardware. Since we're using an STM32 L476, let's look at its datasheet. We can see that we have a bunch of different timers at our disposal. Timers 16 and 17 are good, general-purpose timers with limited features, so we'll use one of those. Note that this microcontroller has other special-purpose timers available, such as watchdog timers. The HAL API relies on SysTick for its delay functions, so we don't want to mess with that. SysTick was originally included to assist real-time operating systems like FreeRTOS with task scheduling. The clock tree is a very useful diagram for figuring out how all these timers and clocks are connected. We can see that timer 16 is connected to some kind of clock multiplier, but is also connected to the APB2 prescaler, which is fed by the CPU clock. Each timer also has its own individual prescaler. So if we set the APB2 prescaler to 8, set the timer multiplier to 2, and set the timer 16 prescaler to 4, we would end up with a total clock divider of 16, which means that timer 16 would count at a rate of 5 MHz. If we look in the reference manual for the L476, we can see all of the registers needed to control the timer. Since we're going to use Cube, MX, and HAL to set everything up for us, we don't need to worry about these too much. However, it can be useful to know that the timer's counter value at any given moment can be found by reading that timer's CNT register. For timer 16, this is a 16-bit register in memory. In STM32 Cube IDE, let's start a new project, find our Nucleo board, and give the project a good name. In the Cube MX perspective, if you go to System Core Sys, you can see that HAL defaults to using the SysTick timer for things like its delay function. If you plan to use a real-time operating system, then you'll want to change this. However, we can leave it alone for now. Go to the Clock Configuration tab and take a look at the prescalers. You can see that we have an 80 MHz CPU clock. We can change the APB2 prescaler, but you can see that the timer multiplier is automatically changed when we do, so pay attention to that if you're messing around with these prescalers. We'll leave everything at its default of 1 for now. Back in the first tab, we can activate timer 16 to use for our own purposes. Take a look at the channel 1 drop-down list. These are the various hardware connections we can make with timer 16. Input capture allows us to automatically store the timer's value when an event happens on a pin. Output compare lets us toggle a pin whenever the value in the timer reaches a certain amount. Pulse width modulation, or PWM, toggles a pin at different duty cycles based on a timer's counter value. Note that these require very specific pins to use, but it can be super helpful to have the hardware control these functions for us without needing to worry about the CPU wasting cycles to run code. We won't get into these functions in this episode, so leave this option disabled. At the bottom, let's change the prescaler to 80. Note that the prescaler register wants one less than the desired clock division number. That's because a value of zero here means use a prescaler of one. A value of one means use a prescaler of two, and so on. 
So we put 80 minus 1 to enter a value of 79 in this option. I like to explicitly write the minus 1 as it helps me remember what the prescaler actually is. This timer can only count up, so we'll leave the counter mode setting alone. The auto reload register is where we set the maximum counting value of our timer. Note that if we leave it at 0, the timer will basically not run at all. We want the timer to count to its maximum 16-bit value, so we'll enter 65,535 here. Once again, I'll put the number of counts and a minus 1 to remind me how many ticks the timer actually performs in one period, including resetting back to 0. With a CPU clock of 80 MHz and a prescaler of 80, the timer runs at 1 MHz, giving us one tick every microsecond. That means the maximum time we can measure with this timer is about 65,000 microseconds, or 65 milliseconds. We'll leave the other settings as default. CKD is used to adjust the deglitching filters. RCR allows us to count multiple reload events, which means we can effectively time events that take longer than 65 milliseconds, assuming we use the other options we've set. The auto reload preload is something you can play with to get more precise timing, but we'll leave it off. Save to generate code and open main.c. To start, we're going to make a very simple application that times how long something takes to process in our microcontroller. Because we want to output the timer value to the serial terminal, we'll include the standard I.O. library. In main, we'll declare a few variables. The first two are our UART buffer and buffer length, which we've been using throughout these episodes. Next is a simple unsigned 16-bit integer variable used to hold our timer value and elapsed time calculations. We'll start by outputting a simple string to the serial terminal to let us know that the program is working. Then we need to call the HalTimerStart function to make our timer start counting. Notice that kubemx automatically put the timer16 init function in here for us. If we check the definition of that function, we can see that our settings were filled out for us and stored in this init struct. It then calls the init function, which sets all the register values that enable the timer to work the way we specified. Back in main in the while loop, we'll use the hal wrapper to read the cnt register for our timer. Next, we'll put in some demi functionality. I'll just tell the processor to wait for 50 milliseconds, but this could be any code that you want to measure how long it takes to execute. Just remember that with the way we have our timer set up, we can't measure anything longer than about 65 milliseconds. I'll take another reading from the timer's CNT register and subtract the original timestamp to get the time elapsed. I'll then print out that elapsed time to the serial terminal and wait one second before doing it again. We'll build the project and go into debugging mode. I'll connect to my Nucleo board using a serial terminal program and press the play button to start running code. You should see the elapsed time being printed to the console. Interestingly enough, it seems that HAL delay takes about one millisecond longer than what we specify. Let's stop the program. Next, we're going to rewrite the famous Blinky program, but we're going to do so with our timer. Go back into the kubemx setup and click on timer16 to open its settings. Because we want to be able to measure time spans of at least one second, we need to change the prescaler. So let's make it 8000, which means that the timer will tick once every 100 microseconds now. Save to regenerate code. We won't need our serial output in this example, so let's get rid of the standard I.O. library and the UART buffer variables. We'll also delete our initial serial output lines of code. We still need to start the timer, so we'll leave the HAL timer base start function in. We'll immediately get a timestamp by reading the CNT register just like we did in the previous example. We'll delete everything that we had written in the while loop. All we want to do is get the current value of the timer and subtract out the previous value in our timestamp. If that's over some value, we'll toggle our LED like we did in the very first episode. Note that the way we compute elapsed time here will work even if the timer rolls over to zero. Because we adjusted the timer's prescaler, it should be ticking every 100 microseconds, or at a rate of 10 kilohertz now. So, if our time difference is equal to or over 10,000, we can say that a second has elapsed. 
It's also important that we update the timestamp after toggling the LED so that we can toggle again a second later. This creates non-blocking code for our Blinky example, as we are no longer waiting for some delay function that consumes our CPU. You could write your own code after this if statement and have it run in between LED toggles. Let's build the project and start running it in debug mode. Press the play button and check your Nucleo board. You should see the LD2 LED blinking on and off each second. If you connect an oscilloscope probe to the LED pin, you can see that it toggles almost exactly once per second. Next, let's see how to do this same thing using interrupts, which will allow us to run no toggling code in the while loop. Let's start by looking at a plot of our timer value over time. When we call the timer base start function, the timer value will begin to increment at the rate specified by our CPU clock and prescalers. At some point, we want it to reach a maximum value and start over. However, at the moment it returns back to zero, we want the timer to trigger an interrupt, which we can write some code to handle. In this interrupt service routine, we'll toggle the LED. This will continue forever so long as our timer is running. To mimic the last program's behavior, we want these interrupts to occur once every second. So the trick is to choose a maximum timer value that allows this to happen. All we need to do is multiply our desired interrupt period by the CPU clock speed over our total prescaler value. In this case, we want one second interrupts with an 80 megahertz clock and a prescaler of 8,000. That gives us a maximum timer value of 10,000. If we look at the HAL API documentation for our timers, we can see the available functions for us to use. Note that we need to use the start underscore IT function if we're using interrupts. Additionally, there are a number of callbacks that can be implemented depending on the type of timer event that has occurred. We care about the timer period elapsed callback as that gets called whenever our timer resets. Back in STM32 Cube IDE, open the Cube MX perspective for our project. We need to change the timer period to 10,000. Remember to keep the minus one in there since the interrupt occurs when the timer resets from 9,999 back to zero, which is the 10,000th tick. You also need to go into the NVIC settings and enable the update and global interrupt flag. Without this, interrupts will not trigger. Save to generate code and go back into main.c. Delete everything in the while loop. This is useful to show how we can toggle an LED without any code in our super loop. Delete the line where we get the current timer value as we don't need that anymore. Remember from the HAL API that we need to change the base start function to base start IT so that it runs in interrupt mode. Finally, head to the bottom of main.c so we can implement our callback function. Note that the HAL library handles the interrupt service routine, which you can look at in stm32l4xx-it.c in the source folder. Somewhere in that service routine, you'll find a call to our callback function here. Note that this callback function is fairly generic as any timer can trigger it. So we're past a handle to the timer struct that caused the interrupt. As a result, it's a good idea to verify that the timer that triggered this interrupt is indeed timer 16. Once we know that, we'll toggle our LED. Save and build the project. Start the debugging perspective and press the play button to begin running the program. If all goes well, the LD2 LED should toggle once per second, just like before. And we can verify that the toggle rate is almost exactly once per second by using an oscilloscope. I hope this helps you get started with timers. I'll make sure a link to the code for these demos can be found in the description. Please subscribe if you want to keep seeing videos like this, and happy hacking!